Hey everybody, Antonio here, and guess what? It's my 100th music-related review, and what better way to kick off this milestone than with a review of Stravinsky's The Rake's Progress, which was shown at the Staatsoper Cher Theater. The conductor was Domingo Hindoyan. The production was done by Krzysztof Walikowski. The set design and costumes were done by Malgor Sata Szczesniak. The lights were handled by Felicia Ross. The videography was done by Denis Guégan. The choreography was done by Claude Badoui. The chorus master was Martin Wright. And the dramaturgy was handled by Jens Scrot. Now, The Rake's Progress premiered back in 1951 at the Teatro La Fenice, which included Igor Stravinsky, the composer himself, on the podium, alongside a star-studded cast of Elisabeth Schwarzkopf in the role of Anne Trulove, Robert Rounceville in the role of Tom Rakewell, Otakar Kraus as Nick Shadow, Raffaele Arie as Father Trulove, and Jenny Turrell as Baba the Turk, and Uwe Bueno as Selim, the auctioneer. Now, I haven't really frequented this opera this much, but I did read the synopsis several times, and I have found a lot of similarities to that of Johann Wilhelm von Goethe's Faust, which was also released into an opera by Zeno, Berlioz, and Boitel. Now, the thing was, is that the only arias that I knew from this opera were Anne's solo, No Word from Tom, and that, of course, of Baba the Turk's solo, in which she's at the auction. And, well, I have to say that this opera is quite similar to that of Faust because this pretty much has a very similar formula. There is a youth by the name of Tom Rakewell who is madly in love with Anne True Love, and they've been together for some time, unlike in the Faust story in which Faust sees a vision of a young girl named Margareta or Gretchen on the spinning wheel. In this opera, basically Tom and Anne have been together for some time, and then we have Mephistopheles in the form of Nick Shadow coming in to tempt Tom into doing a lot of horrid misdeeds of debauchery and constantly getting himself into a lot of trouble, all thanks to our dear friend Nick Shadow, which is also similar to that of the deal done between Mephistopheles and Faust. While Faust regains eternal youth, basically Tom is exposed to worldly pleasures, debauchery, and a lot of other addictions, so to say, that you would pray to God that you won't ever get yourself exposed to. And at the same time, even though they become good friends, as in Nick Shadow and Tom Rakewell, it's Shadow that's leading Tom Rakewell into his own personal destruction until Nick Shadow gets dragged to hell and Tom loses everything, his sanity, his grip on life, and even his one true love and true love. And what's also interesting about this opera is that it's also a nice play on words, like Tom Rakewell. Yes, he may seem like a gentleman, but throughout later in the opera, he starts to do a lot more questionable things and has also started to become a lot more of a libertine, where he's exposed to all of these dirty things. Nick Shadow, obviously because his last name Shadow, meaning that he's a dark figure throughout this opera, and he's somewhat like the devil like Mephistopheles. He's a Mephistophelian figure who tempts Tom Rakewell into self-destruction. Now, Anne Trulove and Father Trulove, I don't need to explain any more about their names, but let's just say that they're the only positive forces of this opera, in which Anne is a very pure, loving, and self-sacrificing young woman, and her father is a stern, firm, yet caring father. Not to mention... This opera was based on a series of paintings done in the 1700s of the same title, in which we see the degeneration of this young man, Tom Rakewell, and he goes from being this rich young man who has a lot of things in life, and then he ends up becoming destitute and insane. 
overall, this opera definitely has a very interesting history. And with such a premiere in 1951 that had a cast like Schwarzkopf, Brownsville, Krauss, Tyrell, Bueno, and Ariet, it was definitely a blast to even realize this sort of history tidbit, especially coming from such a illustrious cast of singers, and just how they basically made history with this opera. So let's get on to what I thought about the production. Now, the people behind this production have transported the original story of the Rake's Progress, which was set in the 1700s England, to, let's say, a huge mansion in Las Vegas. In fact, there are a lot of things in this production that screams that this is set in America, even though the characters keep mentioning the words London and many other towns in England. Now, for a production that's supposed to be like set in England, I was half expecting like the Union Jack to show up, and even some British icons like Queen Elizabeth or Princess Diana, Naughty, and many other like forms of British pop culture. Oh, and also the likes of, let's say, the young ones, Mr. Bean, or Allo Allo, or many other British celebrities to have like a certain reference in this opera. But what we get are a lot of American pop culture references, like we have a character dressed in a Minnie Mouse suit. We got a character, well, mostly in the chorus, dressed as Jem. We have another one dressed as Elvis Presley. We see the American flag. And what's also quite interesting is that, well, Father True Love is mainly a wealthy wealthy man in the opera and in this version he's mainly like a retired boxer who has become a millionaire raising his daughter Anne and basically they sort of have a little well let's just say that not a lot of things can go well from time to time because well Anne's still a young woman still trying to find herself and her daddy dearest wants to make sure that she doesn't get hurt and, well, Anne is sort of like the, in this production, like a, not, I wouldn't say a spoiled diva, but she's like a young, free-spirited, and very much a, like a wild-minded young woman. And especially considering her temper tantrums that she throws at Tom Rakewell for, well, departing. And... Also worth mention mentioning is that throughout the entire opera, Anne somehow descends into or succumbs into alcoholism, smoking, and other types of stuff. And it's not just Tom alone. And this production also made the bold move of turning Baba the Turk from what we know as the bearded lady into a full-on tranny in this production which I thought was a very bold move and very interesting considering that the singer of the role of Baba the Turk was actually a guy singer who also happens to have like a mezzo voice. So he's basically like a male mezzo soprano, much like the singers that we got to know like from the 1600s all the way up to like the 1700s. So it was a very bold move and Let's just say that the whole production had this array of sleaze and darkness, but it was just simply put a very fun experience and quite interesting because this production, though it's usually set in England, I was usually expecting a little bit more of English or British iconography to be shown throughout this opera, but I found it kind of weird that a lot of American iconography is found throughout this opera production, which was quite questionable, but, well, I think if you're going to have a tale based on, like, let's say, sexual morality, well, what better place to set this on, like, the U.S. of A, I guess, so it was an interesting move, and the costumes, well, 
they were actually pretty much reflective of how shocking this production can be. Oh, and another element that I like to add about this production is that there are a lot of cameras moving from left to right, and we see a huge screen, almost like a reality TV show, in which it's pretty much a staple of modern American culture, which is pretty much a sort of degenerate thing, in my honest opinion. So this is sort of quite interesting, as it manages to add like a little bit of social commentary of what the hell is going on in modern culture these days. And it's quite interesting. And before the actual opera started, we had Stefan Wugema and Anna Prohaska as Tom Rakewell and Ann Trulove introducing the original uh, Tom Rakewell who came to Berlin and it was he was basically like seated in the crowd and it was quite interesting, and, well, I have to say that it was also quite fun as well. So overall, this production was quite interesting, though the association with the text of the opera as opposed to, like, the production was kind of, well, it didn't really mesh too well, but it was just quite interesting and somewhat fun. Not to mention the costumes were pretty good all around. And let's get on to what I thought about the singers. The bread and butter of this opera, and probably which made my 100th review very much worthwhile. In the role of Tom Rakewell, who is basically the titular rake, we have Stefan Wugema. Now I saw this tenor as Tamino and Jimmy Mahoney, from Taboshuta and Mahagani, respectively. Like I said, he's a very well-known lyric tenor who specializes in the works by Mozart, specializing in the likes of Tamino and Belmonte, and some works by Wagner, mostly specializing in Logan. He still does a very great job with his very mellifluous-sounding voice and great articulation despite being a native German. And the thing about Tom Rakewell is that this is a tenor role that needs the tenor to sing a lot of fluid passages, and he takes after a lot of the Mozart tenor roles like Belmonte, Don Ottavio, Idomeneo, Tamino, Tito, Ferrando, and Mitridate, Lucio Silla, and also some of the bel canto roles like Edgardo, Elvino, Arturo Talbo and a little bit of some dramatic singing by the likes of, let's say, Lohengrin or Elia Tal. So, in essence, Tom Rakewell needs a full lyric tenor who at the same time can sing very dramatically. And let's just say that Mr. Rugema did his part wonderfully with flying colors. The voice had this very fine instrument that he was always lauded for, and it also helped that he was also a very great actor as well. He didn't go over the top, but he also made like Tom a very lost soul instead of some good guy who turned bad. And he, he just basically made him a very lost soul, a bit of a rebel who finally realized that, oh shit, I've done wrong. I have to end it all. And, well, like I said, he really gave a wonderful performance as Tom Rakewell, all thanks to his very solid technique with a very controlled, very beautiful, very luscious, full lyric tenor voice that he used very well to his advantage and a very wonderful portrayal of the titular rake. So kudos to you, Mr. Rugema. And then his lover, who is Anne Trulove, was sung by the wonderful Anna Prohaska, who, like I said, is one of my most favorite, favorite, favorite lyric sopranos of all time. Now, Anne True Love needs a dramatic coloratura soprano who can also sing lyrically and can also be very convincing as an actress, as she's still a young girl trying to experience what it's like in the world, yet still remain faithful to her one true love, Tom Rakewell. Now, this role requires 
any singer to have the note, have the agility and fluidity of a Queen of the Night, Constanza, Donna Anna, Lucia, Mano, Lulu, Amina, and Elvira, Amalia from Massadieri, Elvira from Ernani, Elena from Vespri Siciliani, and Violetta Valerie from La Traviata. They also have the very delicate singing of the likes of, let's say, like I said, Amina from Sonambula, Elvira from Puritani, or let's say Aitra from Egetisha Helena and Daphne from Daphne. Yeah, also the very lyrical singing of Senka from Arabella and Antonia from Tales of Hoffman and Louise from Shopping King of Louise. So basically, much like her predecessor, Violetta, and True Love needs like three different types of voices. Coloratura singing, some dramatic singing here and there, and very lyrical, soothing singing. And let's just say that Anna Prochaska delivered the goods very gorgeously. Sure, I would have wanted a rounder tone, a more, like, let's say, dramatic coloratura tone, like the likes of Joan Sutherland, Christiana Eda Pierre, Rita Shane, and Eda Moser, Christina Dortecom, and most recently, Elena Moshuk, Laura Aiken, Mary Dunleavy, Darina Zakova, and Diana Damrau, Jessica Pratt, and Olga Karatiapska. But still, she was able to give her all in this role with such a silvery technique that she's extremely well known for. And I, like I said, I also had the pleasure of meeting her once in Salzburg, and it was such a pleasure that I'll never forget. And she had a very solid technique all around, and it's also helped by her tremendous acting. She was able to make Anne a very young female character who's strong, yet also very unsure, because, well, she's still a young woman. She's still trying to find herself in life. She's still trying to get used to her feelings of love, fidelity, and many other things in her life that are very near and dear to her, and especially that of caring for her father. And like I said, Prochaska has a very gorgeous instrument, and she has, well, a very well-controlled and very beautiful technique that she used very well. and. She really sang her heart out, especially in her aria, No Word from Tom, and especially when she soared to the I Go to Him. She sang it with such conviction and such, such luminosity that I was completely like left breathless. It was just a very well-controlled technique that she had and a very wonderful voice that is still wonderful to this very day. And I could see a definite future in Anna Prochaska in a lot of the Italianate roles, like Gilda from Rigoletto, Marina from Don Pasquale, Rosina from Barber of Seville, heck, even Lisa from La Sonambula, and Giulietta from I Capuletti e Montecchi, and of course, Juliet from Romeo e Juliet, and maybe even Lacme from Lacme. We'll see what happens. And possibly a Musetta can be expected in the near future for someone like Anna Prochaska because she has a very solid technique, a very gorgeous and well controlled voice that managed to cope with the coloratura exceedingly and with such flying, flying colors, and of course, a close attention to the text and very dramatic acting, which was just simply put awesome coming from the likes of Miss Prochaska. So a huge kudos to Anna Prochaska for a very wonderful portrayal of Anne True Love. And fun fact, she's also performed this role in the Staatsopernschule Theater for five years. So she really knew what she was doing with this role. She knew every subtext, every, like, every piece of line that makes Anne True Love a living human being, and she really 
really let it out with flying colors. And singing the role of Nick Shadow was Gidon Sachs, who I saw last year as John Claggart from Britain's Billy Budd. Now, the best way I can describe any singer who does Nick Shadow is this. While he's basically sung by either a baritone or a basso, I pretty much prefer either a bass baritone or a basso singing this role. One has to make sure that he has all of the acting capabilities of a Don Giovanni and a Mephistopheles, and a voice as round as Boris Godunov, Hans Sachs, um, Henry the Fowler from Lohengrin, and basically all the kings like Philip II from Don Carlo, or Banco from Verdi's Macbeth, or the King of Egypt from Aida, and many, many other fine basso cantante roles. And with the role of Nick Shadow, you need either a bass baritone or a basso cantante who can exude evil from every pore. Because the thing about Nick Shadow is that, like I've mentioned, he's also pretty much a descendant of Mephistopheles from Faust. And let's just say that when it comes to playing villainous roles, Gidon Zax really can let it rip. Granted, I will say one thing about his costume. I did not like that wig in the first few acts. I thought it looked horrid on him. I mean, I also heard from a couple of my friends, Ann Byrne, Sarah Ring, David, and a new friend of mine, Jenny, who was also a soprano, state that, yes, of course, Gidon did not like the wig himself. And he probably could have just asked to just leave it as it is because, well, Gidon is really a very handsome man. And I don't know what the hell the production people were thinking to make him wear that wig. I understand that he was supposed to be like Andy Warhol in this, well, video of him eating a cheeseburger. But other than that, I thought that wig looked hideous on him. I mean, it would have been fine if he left his natural hair in this role. And let's just say that his costume in the last act was slightly better, but I didn't really care for that because he's truly an elegant-looking man. He pretty much deserved a better costume for the likes of Nick Shadow. He could have been in a trench coat. He could have been in, like, let's say, a dark blue or a velvety black trench coat or even a leather jacket. Hell, he could have had kept his natural dark colored hair throughout the entire evening. But ranting aside, I will say that he's still a very fine singer, and like I said, he is pretty much in his element when he's playing baddies. Take a good look at Claggart from Billy Budd and Hagen from Goethe Demeron, and you'll see what I mean. Oh, and he's also saying Don Giovanni, so that's another... Oh, and also Mephistopheles, so that's another baddie role that he also sang. I'm not so sure that he also sang Boris Godunov, but I pretty much have a feeling that he sang that role as well. So when it comes to baddies, he really was in his element. It's helped by his rich, round, cavernous, sensual voice that he exuded very well. And he exuded all the demonic qualities of Nick Shadow extremely well with such frisson, excitement, and passion. It was just a very riveting portrayal of a very Mephistophelian figure and all thanks to the very solid technique of Mr. Gion Zax. Singing the role of Anne True Love's father, Father True Love, was Jan Martinik, who I saw a couple of years ago as Zarastro in the Schiller Theater's production of The Magic Flute. Here, he's still in very fine voice. He looked very imposing, yet can be tender at times, but he had a very imposing presence and a very, very rich and resonant voice. Now, the thing about seeing the role of Father True Love is that, yes, it is a small role, but this role needs a basso profondo voice who can sing his notes very well, especially that of the low notes. Now think of the, like, any singer who has sung the likes of Fafner or Fazolt or Hagen, Hunding, 
Tijarao, Gordon Amon, Landgrave, Herman, Henry the Fowler, Comendatore, Osmin, Zarastro, the Grand Inquisitor, Ramphis, Sparafucile, or Baculus, or Arkel, Marcel from Les Huguenots, who would sing this role, since it's no surprise that this role was created by Raffaele Arie, who is also very well known for singing Osmin, the Commendatore, Zarastro, Filippo, the Grand Inquisitor, and many other roles for either a basso cantante or a basso profondo. Here, I thought Martinique gave his all in this, this thankless yet very rewarding role, and he really sang to the best of his abilities and really acted the part really well as a gruff yet caring father to Anne True Love. And then we have the role of Mother Goose, sung by Ursula Hesse von den Steinen, who I saw last year in the Netherlands as the fortune teller from Arabella, and she's also my Facebook friend. And she's still in very fine voice, and it's helped that she has a very gorgeous and very, well, smoky timbre that basically brought out that sensuality and maturity of Mother Goose. Now, the thing about Mother Goose is that she has to be sung by a contralto with very solid low notes. For example, any contralto who has sung the likes of Mama Lucia or Hecuba from Le Troyon or Ursula from Beatrice Benedict or even that of the Omniscient Muscle from Siegetische Helena by Richard Strauss. She basically needs a very solid contralto voice. And, well, Ursula Hesse von den Steinen is mainly a dramatic mezzo who did attempt a few soprano roles like Marie from Wozzeck and Giulietta from Tales of Hoffman, and also that of Vitalia from La Clemenza di Tito. Still, I thought she was able to sing her low notes very well, and she was able to act out her part really well with all that sleaze and that type of maturity and that all-knowing nature that Mother Goose has. And she, I could really tell that she had a lot of fun with this role. It was definitely a very riveting performance even though the character is quite thankless. And then we get to Baba the Turk, sung by Nicolas Pielinski, who is a male mezzo-soprano. Now, the interesting thing is, even though Baba the Turk is usually sung by a female singer, more specifically a dramatic mezzo or a mezzo-contralto, in this evening he was basically sung by a male mezzo. Now, Baba the Turk needs a dramatic mezzo or a mezzo contralto who can also be able to be a good actress as well. Now think of any like interpreter of Baba the Turk who has sung the likes of a lot of the dramatic mezzo soprano repertoire. You know the likes of Eboli, Amneris, Frecca, Valtrauta, Dorigena, Lady Macbeth, Frederica from Louisa Miller, or even that of the mezzo contralto repertoire, like Lola from Cavalleria Rusticana, the first maid from Richard Strauss's Electra, the role of Anina from Strauss's Der Rosenkavalier, and even that of Margaret from Berg's Wozzeck. Now, I was extremely blown away by Mr. Tzielinski's performance as Baba the Turk, even though I do expect a more dramatic mezzo, like a dramatic mezzo performer or a mezzo contralto singing Baba the Turk, I thought that he was able to give the role his all very well, and he was able to portray Baba the Turk's catty nature towards Tom Rakewell extremely well, that it was definitely a, an extremely enjoyable performance coming from the likes of Mr. Zielinski. And then we get to the minor parts, which, is, which are Zelem sung by Patrick Vogel, and Zellum needs to be sung by either a character tenor or a light lyric tenor. Any tenor who has sung the likes of Mima from Das Eingold and Siegfried, 
and even that of the captain or the fool from Berg's Wozzeck. And in terms of a light lyric tenor singing the role of Zelim, he probably might have need to have sung the likes of Tamino, Ferrando, Pedrillo, Iacchino, or even that of Nemorino, Ernesto, Tonio, and many, many other roles for Tenor Leggero. And here, I thought Patrick Vogel sang his role very well, helped by a very solid technique that he has in his voice. Sure, it's a character voice, but it didn't sound hideous. It didn't sound ugly. It sounded very pleasant to listen to. It sounded very lyrical, and it sounded so in tune that it was just simply put an instrument that had completely blown me away, even though this character only appears in one part of the opera. Still, it was a very enjoyable performance, <clears throat> excuse me, and it was definitely fantastic singing done by Mr. Patrick Vogel, even though this role is extremely thankless to either a character tenor or a light lyric tenor. And then we have the smaller, smaller role of the Keeper of the House, sung by Maximilian Krumen. Very fine in voice, and pretty good with his acting. Like, very good with his acting. And like I said, the role of the Keeper of the House has to be sung by a character bass, even though it's a very thankless part. So he sang it with a very fine voice, and it was also a pretty enjoyable experience as well. The conducting done by Maestro Domingo Hindoyan was wonderful all around, and it was just fantastic. He really understood that this opera took cues from the likes of Purcell, Handel, Mozart, Bach, and many other composers of the 1700s. Hence, that's also why the Rake's Progress was originally set in the 1700s, so he really evoked that style very well. So overall, what a milestone this was, and to especially celebrate my 100th review with this particular production of Igor Stravinsky's The Rake's Progress. There was extremely fine singing all around with the main couple, Stefan Wulgema and Anna Prohaska, really nailing it as the main couple, Gidon Zaks really, really working it as the main villain, Nick Shadow, a very weird yet very fun production, and of course, fabulous conducting done by Maestro Hindoyan. So a huge, huge, huge kudos to all of the singers, especially to Anna Prohaska, Stefan Wulgema, Gidon Zaks, Jan Martinik, Ursula Hesse von den Steinen, Nikolas Zielinski, Patrick Vogel, and Maximilian Krumen, all of the chorus members of the Staatsopernschule Theater, all of the orchestra members of the Staatsopernschule Theater, and of course to everyone working behind the production, and of course to the conductor himself, Maestro Domingo Hindoyan, for making my 100th review very much worthwhile. And if I were to give this production a rating, even though I kind of give it like an like a 7 out of 10, the rest I would just give it 10s all around. And despite that, I would probably give it, well, a 9 out of 10. It was very much well worth it and definitely enjoyable. If you haven't seen this production of The Rake's Progress yet, or if you haven't seen The Rake's Progress yet, or even heard about this opera, I highly suggest that you either watch it on live, watch it on YouTube, listen to some excerpts on Spotify, and I assure you, you will not be disappointed. And if any of you are planning to watch this production done at the Staatsopernschule Theater, then please do, especially when it comes to the fine singing done by Anna Prohaska, Stefan Wulgema, and Giron Zaks, and Jan Martinique. You will not be disappointed at all. Well, that's all for now. It was definitely a blast since this is my 100th review. But alas, as real life comes and goes, I would have to say that I probably might have to take a hiatus because, well, a lot of things are happening, especially in my acting school, since we're going to have like a lot of summer theater rehearsals here and there. So I'm probably going to be very busy. 
I'm not so sure what I'm going to do for summer vacation. I'm thinking of going to, like, let's say, Munich for the summer because there are a lot of opera productions there, most specifically a Lucia production starring Diana Damrau, which I am quite excited for. But we'll see what happens in the near future. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens if ever I am in the mood for it or not. We'll see if anything comes up. And if there's going to be a review, there's going to be a review. If there is not going to be a review, then probably I might have to go to like more film reviews or whatnot. So we'll see what happens. So until then, this is Antony signing off, wishing all a good night. And, well, I hope you all enjoyed my 100th.